Yeah, thanks, Katie. And, and thanks, everyone, for joining the Maximizing PeopleSoft Tools for Accelerating Your PeopleSoft Transformation uh, webinar. Uh, it's good to see so many folks that uh, on the line that already utilized Alir's accelerator tools. Uh, we have made and continue to make many enhancements to the tools themselves, and I'll point those out as we go along. Uh, for those that are new uh, to seeing the tools, hopefully you'll see some benefit out of these as, as well as kind of how we address these type of projects or any, any type of transformation, uh, you, uh, optimization, whether it be a pump update uh, or even a 9.2 upgrade. Um, this, these tools are very flexible in that regard. So uh, hopefully you see some value. I'm an associate partner uh, with Alir. I lead our PeopleSoft practice, uh, which includes, like I mentioned, uh, upgrades, implementations, optimizations, and pretty much anything PeopleSoft. Uh, uh, we do, we've, we've been doing a lot of work in PeopleSoft since our uh, inception, and we continue to uh, grow the practice. I have 20 plus years of PeopleSoft technical and upgrade expertise, uh, and have been working on a number of 9.2 upgrades, over 12 of those, uh, since 2013, when, when Pum, uh, PeopleSoft 9.2 came out with Pump Zero. Uh, just a quick uh, overview of Alir. We were established in 2005, so we're celebrating 16 years of business. Uh, we help our clients succeed by partnering with them efficiently uh, in, to help efficiently implement, integrate, and upgrade their software investments. Uh, we are, consider ourselves a trusted advisor to our clients is, is really uh, the key message here, uh, which is why we developed these accelerator tools to begin with. So when we when you engage with Alir, we bring all, all of what we have as, as you know, as as, uh, you know, tools to help uh, make your project successful. Uh, we're also recognized as a member of Oracle's Cloud Excellence Implementer, uh, which is the CEI program. So it's, we don't only do people soft. We also do uh, the Oracle Cloud as well. Uh, so why we're here, uh, problems, or I'm sorry, we're, we're gonna cover uh, quickly the agenda. Uh, we'll talk about the problem statements and why you're here, hopefully. Uh, we'll, we'll do an overview of the customization identification tool, which is a tool that we help, you know, um, it kind of runs side by side with the uh, database compare uh, process within PeopleSoft, uh, but it provides a lot more value uh, at the end of the day. Uh, then we'll talk about our scope object tracker tool, which is a suite of tools uh, that help you manage your project and your project efforts. And then we'll do a wrap up. Uh, so problem statements, why we're here. Uh, how do you, many customers struggle with how do you begin to make sense of the potentially vast number of PeopleSoft enhancements? Uh, reading a compare report is often an exercise in frustration. You know, how, how the compare report's broken up, it doesn't really add value as, as far as how these customized objects relate to each other. Uh, documentation is often severely lacking within an organization. Uh, how many customizations? Um, do we have? A lot of customers don't know. What type of customizations are they within, within your application? Uh, how are custom, customized objects grouped together? I just mentioned that uh, to provide full visibility to your customizations. So when you're talking about customizations, how are they grouped together? And that makes that much more an efficient process. Could some of your customizations now be replaced with delivered functionality? That's something obviously with each PUM update or if you're on 9.2, you should be considering that at, um, you know, as you look at the scope of the effort, obviously you're not trying to fix everything with each pump update, um, but certainly keeping yourself informed of what that new functionality is and whether it, it's possible to include that as part of your project scope. How can you more efficiently manage scope, project effort, and resource capacity? And that's what the, a lot of these tools um, hope to address. Um, just quickly, here's a kind of a, a, a library, I guess, of, of the customization uh, accelerator tools we have. Uh, the first one we'll, we'll dive into here in a second is how you identify the customizations and group those using the, the compare reports. Uh, the, the remainder of these tools are all part of our uh, scope tracker uh, suite of tools, uh, which helps you manage your scope, helps you manage any new requirements that may come out, which are typically we call disconnects or, or pain points. Uh, there's built-in dashboards with throughout the tools to help you track your the progress of your of your effort and understand where things lie. Um, there's raid logs for um, for um, managing your uh, your risks, your action items, uh, any decisions, key decisions. Uh, and as I mentioned, effort trackers. Again, these are, are key dashboards. We'll take a look at here in a minute. So diving into the the first tool, which is our customization identification tool, uh, it was developed uh, in. It was developed uh, within the PeopleSoft application using native, native PeopleSoft. Uh, it utilizes the, uh, the delivered uh, compare report process. 
So whether that's a full database compare or if you're just doing a compare on uh, a pump image, perhaps, uh, this, this tool can run against that, uh, that particular project. Um, so that's the first step is running that uh, database compare. Uh, the, the, we then have an application engine that was developed, which groups all the customizations associated with that project. So uh, again, you know, whatever is included in that project compare, it creates a project. This, this process essentially references the project and we're able to group those customizations that are, that are associated with that particular project. Uh, and then the application engine calls a BI publisher report, which then groups the customizations uh, at the component level. Uh, and that grouping uh, is, is really the key. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the compare report itself is, a, is just a, a dump of all your customized objects group, grouped at the object type. Uh, it doesn't really tell you how they're interrelated and how they fit within the application. So that's exactly what this BI publisher report is doing, uh, taking the output from the application engine, group, uh, grouping the customizations, and then really showing you how, they're, how, how they formulate underneath a, a PeopleSoft component also providing the, uh, the navigation for that component. Uh, the process facilitates a more efficient method for analyzing the customized objects, obviously. Uh, customized objects not reported on the BI publisher, so things that aren't really part of the online application are easily identified uh, and also efficiently grouped, either using SQL tools or PS query. Uh, so we have a listing of all the customizations that the, the output of the compare report uh, provide. We know which ones were picked up by the online process itself and those get flagged. So we know what's remaining and most of those we consider offline. And these are things like application packages, application engines, any security queries, things like that. Anything that would essentially be part of a compare report output uh, that, that does not relate to an online customization. Uh, again, it's easy to query those in our staging tables and get those captured as well. Uh, so I, I wanted to show, it, it's not as easy since this is just a, a process itself. I did want to show uh, an example of the, of the output uh, of, and, and this is a, a sample of the output of the online customization tool. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, it's grouped at the component level. So of course, we're going to provide you the, the, the menu, the component itself. Uh, and, the, and the key part of this is obviously the navigation. That's what users or people uh, that utilize the application are most familiar with. Uh, and then under that, again, we show all the customized objects that were part of that compare report process. So if it's a full database compare, essentially we're going to capture all your customizations that are online and provide the, um, the component they're associated with. And again, this is how we typically would evaluate a customization. It's the grouping underneath a, a business process, or in this case, a component. <clears throat> and then, we, you know, obviously we'll have a number of these online um, output, you know, a number of components possibly that come out of the detail. Uh, once everything's uh, output, we do a summer, uh, summarization, essentially. Uh, this is more for, uh, you know, the management team or, or, or whatnot to see where the customizations fall at a modular level. So we typically, and it's a, it's a somewhat of a manual process, but it's easy to get to the information so we can do it fairly quickly. And again, we like to evaluate customizations within the module and whether they are delivered. So a delivered, we consider if, if it's part of an online um, uh, online delivered component, we consider that uh, delivered. And, then, and, and if it's essentially a new bolt-on component that was built by uh, the customer, uh, we consider that obviously a bolt-on. And those are very much less in invasive as everybody knows. Uh, and then obviously uh, a key um, effort or uh, priority that we typically you know, invoke on our customers for those delivered online, we typically like to evaluate those to see if we can minimize that impact. Uh, but this just provides an overview again, where the customizations lie within the application, which ones are bolt-ons, which are uh, invasive delivered, uh, provided some percentages around that. And then also we kind of break out the offline separately to show, you know, um, you know, these aren't specific to the online application itself, but they do reside in the application, whether it be SQRs, app engines, um, app packages and such. Uh, and then we just kind of give a total for, you know, again, this is more management consumption to, to un really understand where the customizations lie and how they're broken out. Um, all right. So that's the customization identification, which is a key part of project scope. So now I'm gonna transition into our scope object tracker tool. So now that we've kind of identified one key piece of, uh, of, of uh, the potential project scope, which is our customizations, um, 
we now want to gather any other possible um, scope items that we want to include as part of our effort potentially. Uh, and those can, are typically things like new features that are available within a POM image. Um, and obviously, you know, as most customers do, we, we leverage the cumulative feature overview for that um, with each POM. Uh, there could be disconnects again, uh, and, and a disconnect is a pain point essentially. It's anything that impedes the effectiveness or efficiency of a process. Uh, so we capture those. Those don't necessarily become a scope item themselves right away, but we do capture those in our requirements um, area within the tool that we'll take a quick peek at. And then those essentially will get uh, addressed and potentially even linked to a scope item. So if it's a new feature that can, can essentially resolve a disconnect or a pain point within the tool, we can reference that scope item which is the, represents the new feature uh, that will address that disconnect. And the idea is every disconnect would, would be evaluated and hopefully resolved. Uh, and then there could be other scope items, um, like things like work request backlogs, things that are maybe have sit, been sitting around, uh, you know, as a lower priority item, any open issues or potentially even related uh, roadmap related items. So really anything that can make up scope is something that could be considered for use within the scope object tracker tool. But like I said, the main two are typically your customizations. And again, those are coming from the process we just reviewed and new features. Those are the two, usually the two large um, areas. Um, and then typically, you know, during, uh, as we're evaluating these scope items, uh, we typically like to have analysis workshops where each of these scope objects are reviewed. Uh, we do that within the scope object tracker tool, which we're about to dive into to take a peek at. Uh, but the tool again organizes those things uh, very well. It allows key um, data elements to be set. Uh, and then there, like I mentioned, and we'll take a look at, there's many dashboards that help you uh, help you manage the, the effort, whatever the project may be, whether, again, a POM update or an upgrade. Uh, and then obviously, um, each of the scope items we, we, we reviewed typically fall, and most people, a lot of folks that are on Oracle are familiar with the Rice W concept. Um, so we will have customizations that fall uh, within reports, interfaces. Uh, the new features obviously are the CFO items I mentioned. Uh, enhancements are those bolt-ons and customizations and potentially even items that are workflow that are customized. Uh, so diving into the scope object tracker tool, and again, this is where we'll spend the the remainder of, uh, of our time kind of looking at the tool itself. Um, uh, the scoped ob object tracker tool supports the gathering of the key data elements that we just described, uh, which allows final project scope to be set thoughtfully and with confidence. So again, uh, once we load the tracking tool uh, with the customizations from, the, from step one, the customization tool, or from the CFO, those objects are then further evaluated, further um, updated, you know, classified, uh, and, and the, and all of this is happening within the scope object tracker tool. And, we, and as we'll see, you, you'll be able to track the progress of the, of the effort of addressing those customizations or, or new features. Uh, the scope tracker can be used to support various project efforts. I mentioned that. So it doesn't just have to be an upgrade or an implementation. Uh, we use the tool uh, quite heavily for PUM update projects, uh, optimizations, and other focus, focused efforts. Uh, the scope object tracker also facilitates tracking end scope items through uh, the project life cycle. Um, and that's what I yeah, wanted to spend more time on here in a few minutes. So it's not just identifying those and making key decisions and, and providing uh, input into the item. It's actually doing, you know, tracking the work and, and the progress of the work and understanding who's assigned to do the work and how the capacity of that resource is, is, is tracking along as we move through the actual project itself. All right. Uh, next slide. Um, so one of the key elements that I just wanted to point out as we go, get into the tool, you, as, as we make key decisions and understand e each of these scope items, we typically like to make a decision and we call these the seven R's as far as what we're gonna do with the scope item. That's one of the key items that gets tracked within the tool. And when we say the seven R's, they, they are, um, are we gonna retain a customization? Is it something that provides value, enough business value that we wanna keep? Um, is it possibly something that can be removed? These are nice. If, if a new feature can remove a customization, um, we, we would consider that a replace. Uh, but a lot of those nice to have so as, as we're going through these things, you know, um, we, we see a lot of customers really questioning, yes, this was good back in the day, but do we really need it? Let's remove it. 
A, a re-engineer is something that we see a lot of traction on recently. And a, basically a good example of a re-engineer is taking a customization and utilizing the, the new tools, uh, people tools, eight, five, eight capabilities, uh, things like the drop zones, uh, event mappings, uh, page and field configurator. So we see a lot of that where, uh, yes, a, a customization still adds the value and, and there's no delivered solution for that customization, uh, but we can it, you minimize the invasiveness of the customization uh, to support future PUM. Uh, and we classify those as re-engineers. Uh, a redesign is a customization that really just needs rebuilt from the ground up. And that, that's typically a large work of effort. And hopefully we, um, you know, your, your organization doesn't have many of those. Uh, but there are cases where it's necessary, where, you know, um, again, there's not a 9-2 delivered uh, functionality that addresses your, your need. Uh, it, and it's really just, from, even from an end user standpoint, it's not working well. So it needs rebuilt and redesigned from the ground up. Uh, and then a request is essentially just that, it's a new feature. All right, so with that, I will jump into the scope object tracker tool itself. Let me switch screens here. Okay, so hopefully uh, you can see me, Katie, on the tiles. Um, yep, so, okay, great. So this is uh, out of the box when we deliver our accelerator tools. We, we have a Fluid Home page that comes along with that, and it's kind of a, a good organization, just like any other PeopleSoft 9.2 Fluid Home page. It's a good organization of the various components within the tools. Uh, it really kind of breaks down the, the suite of um, web tools themselves. So, we, you know, we have things like a lot of the dashboards, uh, the RAID log. Uh, I mentioned the, um, uh, the requirements tracker, which is the, those disconnects that, you know, again, those are items that don't necessarily become scope yet, but items that we want to address. Uh, and then, um, you know, some, some pretty cool pivot grids and whatnot, and we'll take a peek at those. But I am going to first jump into just the, the scope tracker tool itself. Um, and again, um, it's all built native PeopleSoft. And I'm just going to pull one um, one uh, scope item up. So this is now we're in a scope item, and you, you can see um, this looks very familiar with the output from the customization identification process. And that's exactly where this came from. So this is a customization that was identified again at the grouped at the component level. Uh, this is very much the same information that was captured on the report, and we utilize a component interface to get that information loaded. So we're not having to obviously rekey uh, all the output from that uh, from that from that process in BI Publisher report. Uh, so we have a, a pretty facilitated uh, process to, to get these things loaded. Uh, so this is kind of what you'll see typically on the scope description, the, you know, the key information as far as the, the component, the navigation. And then from this point, again, this is where more detail can be added throughout the, the, the process. So as we're having these facilitated working sessions, you know, our consultants or your team will be adding more detail to these things. Um, we also have the ability to, to attach, obviously native PeopleSoft attachment is down here. So if you had any previous documents um, that pertain to this particular customization, we can certainly attach those as well. So the idea is this is kind of the, the new book of record of that customization throughout the, the, uh, throughout the, the project life cycle, uh, whatever effort you're undertaking. Uh, a lot of this information will come pre-populated. Uh, so it's, for instance, the data source, um, this is obviously coming from the online customization identification tool. Uh, that's where we'll, we'll see all the online customizations come there. If it happened to be an app package or uh, SQR, you know, again, those are identified. We consider those offline. Uh, through our queries, we're able to capture those and get those loaded through the CIs as well. Uh, and those will get identified as such, uh, you know, with, with, what type of uh, where they came from. Um, even down to the program type in many cases. Uh, and then of course, uh, you know, uh, grouping things by the module, we even get a specific at the process, uh, at the business process level, if you like, a lot of customers, you know, want to keep it more high level, but others want to get more specific to the process. And, and, and again, these are all queryable. So if you, uh, you know, if you had different people that were responsible for different business process areas, they could easily get to their items just by filtering by the business process. Uh, the scope type, uh, again, is, is uh, new features or customizations. You can even get down to the Rice W level. Um, and then I mentioned the seven R's, and we'll kind of circle back to that idea. Uh, but as we're making key decisions about this, about this particular scope item, uh, as far as what's the business priority, again, th these are items more, we're getting 
now more into the specific data elements that we want to capture during the sessions or during your, your discussions with your business teams. As far as what the business priority is for this particular customization, what's the complexity, that type of thing. Um, um, we'll, we'll also look at impacts. So, you know, is this impacting other systems? In this case, it's impacting uh, an Ariba system. Um, impact to people. Uh, this is big as well, because this is what we'll be able to determine what, what training, if we do, the, if, assuming this was a new feature uh, and we decide to implement the new feature, what's the impact going to be? And that's going to help your, your organization determine what the potential training um, efforts going to be needed, uh, what change management um, is going to be necessary. So it kind of helps you manage that, that piece of it as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, when we when, once we kind of discuss the, the in this case, this customization um, and understand the priority and complexity and all these type of things, understand if there's nine two capabilities and, um, and and there's business value to this customization, we make this the, the recommendation. And again, hopefully a lot of these become replaces and removes uh, because they're, uh, you know, the, there's new functionality that can take care of this. Uh, but in many instances, there's a retain, which is, you know, where we're going to keep an item. Um, so uh, that's the 7R classification. And we'll take a, a, another deeper dive using some of the pivot grids to see what that uh, looks like. And as we, you know, as we start looking at things holistically, you know, we're just looking at one scope item now. Um, cost benefit. So this is another key component of the tool itself. And the reason we're repeating, and again, this is just information that would get carried forward from the first uh, from the first worksheet, is the complexity, scope, type, and recommendation. Um, we, you, you are able to change those here as well, but they, it is the same field essentially. And the reason we put these up here is because these three items combined will help define the effort associated with the item. So, for instance, uh, in this case, this is a um, is a low complexity item. It's a customization. Um, it's not, it's, so it's a, a customization to deliver and the recommended action is retain. And we have essentially a configuration table that can be updated for each customer. And, and typically it is, it, it's kind of what the, what the customer is most comfortable with. Uh, for those three, a combination of these three items, we have a row in that configuration table defaulting in these areas of, of effort. Uh, the first one is development. So how much development is required? In this case, it's a retain. So it's going to be it's going to be a retrofit of the existing customization, um, and it's a low, so it's not very complex. So we defaulted in two hours of development time. Um, on the functional side, we break it out a little more granular. So we have design hours. In this case, it's already a customization that exists. So there's no no design required. It's something we're carrying forward. Uh, Configuration hours, again, in this case, there's zero, but if this was a new feature, we would have design hours, we would have configuration hours. Um, and then uh, functional unit tests. So obviously, yes, this is something that's being brought forward, but it does require testing. Uh, so we, we consider functional unit testing uh, reasonable assurance that the, th that the item is working, and then it gets typically migrated to a, a, to a formal testing environment. So uh, these all get defaulted, uh, again, based on these three items, complexity, scope, type, and recommended action, all configurable for the defaults. So if you want to globally make this higher, we just change the configuration table that stores these, and then the default would be uh, that value. Um, and, and you can kind of see if I move the complexity up, you'll see kind of the hours change. So if it's a high complexity, the hours flip, and, and, and I can continue to move those around. Um, if I were to change uh, the recommended action, obviously a retain is much lower. Um, if this was ha happened to be like a re-engineer, you can see the hour switch as well. So again, this all comes from configuration, but these values can be overridden. And that's, uh, and that's what this, uh, this page uh, represents here. It, it, let's say there's a one-off where, yeah, not all retains need to be adjusted, but this one particular retain does. You can override the development hours here. Um, let's say we want to make it four hours, so double the uh, development, uh, as well as each individual of the three components within the functional. Uh, so if we wanted to make this, uh, we think the testing is going to take longer. We, we want to make it one hour. That happens here. And then all these overrides get reflected in the dashboards that we'll see shortly. All right. So once these hours are determined, um, we can go on to the sign off in hours uh, tab. And you can see the hours that came from the prior um, cost and benefit sheet um, get carried over. 
And if there are hours uh, we, we see a uh, needed flag underneath the, the individual category is yes. And that helps our dashboards determine, yes, I need to grab these values. Um, th there's other reasons for that, but they get carried forward from that page. Um, and again, these are the baseline hours. And let's say we get into the work. So we, uh, I should, let me step back. We, we would assign the resources that are, that are gonna be doing the work. So in this case, we'll have a Lear developer one assigned to this work. So this now becomes, uh, it takes away capacity from a Lear dev one, the resource uh, is assigned to them. So we'll see how we track um, the capacity of that resource and then how much capacity is remaining throughout as we're working through the items. But let's say earlier developer one started working on the item and he feels it's higher. Uh, we want to keep the baseline um, because that was the final, you know, that, assuming that was kind of, that number was considered as part of the finalized scope. The, the developer then could uh, uh, update the estimated hours here. And typically we have some uh, policies around if it's, you know, if it's uh, increased or decreased by a certain percentage, then it requires further approval. So all that, you know, this is native people soft. So, um, you know, again, you can get, um, get get creative as far as if notifications or things like that uh warning messages all that out of the box we don't have those turned on uh, but they can change those hours and all the all the dashboards then would also uh, look at these estimated hours that were updated uh, and then this is more pmo related here obviously we can put in dates of start end, uh, and and then you know and that's typically what we'll do we'll do the assignments we'll, we'll put in the uh, estimated start end uh, and so everything for all four items so that, you know, as we're finalizing scope, everything's assigned. Uh, we look at our resource capacity, making sure every resource isn't over allocated. And I'll, again, I'll show that page. Uh, and then once this is saved, the, per, the, the, the Allure developer one would start the work and he would come in as often as you, your organization requires. At, at a minimum, we, we typically recommend once a week, they would come in and put their actual hours spent. Um, and that's more of an optional field, um, but we typically encourage customers to use that. Uh, but this percent complete is the key because that's gonna drive the remaining effort and all the dashboards uh, that are tracking the progress. This is gonna show us what's remaining on the on this item. And the dashboards are obviously at a more summary level. We'll see what's, what's remaining uh, across the board. Okay, so. That is essentially this, this, the scope tracker at the item level. So what I want to do now is kind of take a peek at some of the dashboards and reporting that come out of this, uh, which is very, this is, the, you know, very useful, obviously. Um, so for every item, we would go through and make those categorizations um, and recommendations. Uh, one of the key, this is one of our newer um, pivot grids that we have, and it's within the tiles. We can see within the project scope, um, you know, how, how the effort, what, 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 how are our, where are our recommendations falling? So in this case, this is in the entire scope of the project, whatever uh, effort this is, we can see that we are retaining 55% of our customizations. We are requesting 12% of items of the, of total items. 12% of those are new features. We're re-engineering 11% of items um, overall, and we're, we are removing 13%. So that's for all modules across the, the entire project. If we wanted to then just take a deeper dive into accounts payable, we can go to the left here and click on the, the AP graph and the pivot grid would then calculate for AP. Um, and you can see the filter at the very top here, accounts payables. You can see how AP is breaking down. In this case, we, we're only retaining 30, 32% of AP's customizations. Uh, we're replacing 18% of those customizations. We're re-engineering 16%. So, and again, you can do that drill down for, uh, for each module just to see how those seven R's are broken out. So that's one view uh, that helps. And again, this is probably more at the leadership project, uh, project management level. Um, and then I'll jump into a module dashboard, which shows similar information, just a little, little more detailed. And I should say, you can break these out by different phases. Um, the views of you know, how we classify scope items, it's at the scope item level. We can say, if, is this related to a Pump 26 project effort? Is this related to the upgrade 9.2 effort? You can break up as many phases as you want um, and track it at that phase level. So uh, like I said, when, you know, we typically, our customers typically use this during their upgrade project, but they continue to use it through pump updates and all the history from the upgrade is still there. They just create a new a phase and we can view everything by the phase. Uh, you can look at everything as an all. So if you want to look at all phases, um, you can you can get an idea by module 
um, you can look to see how many retains there are, how many replaces, how many uh, you know uh, requests, those type of things. I mean, this gets this is a little bit of an eye chart, but it really gets down to the very detailed granular level. Uh, what's the priority of the items by module? What's the complexity? Um, you, it gets, uh, you know, like I said, down to the impact. You can view things at that level. Uh, and then it also, this is a very summary level of the total for, for each module. What's the total dev hours associated with the uh, with all the scope items and what's the total functional hours? Um, and I'll show you a dashboard that also breaks the functional hours down to that lower level, which is the three, uh, the three uh, sub-level areas, which is design, configuration, and functional unit test. Uh, but again, this is all critical information, typically at the project management level, as you're looking at um, you know, how decisions are trending and how, um, how much effort is being associated with those decisions. Um, and and I'll, also, I'll just point out some of these percentages so you can kind of get a real quick, real-time view of how many uh, customizations you're removing percentage-wise. And I use this quite a bit just to say, okay, accounts payable is playing, playing very well. They're, they're about 26% of removal. Uh, then you can kind of go down and say, well, well, why are some of these other areas um, like expenses only 14%? It kind of gives you an idea of how things are trending across the different modules. Uh, so that's that's uh, one view. Um, and let's see, do a time check here. Okay. Oh, we're running, we're on short. I, I just want to show one more uh, uh, dashboard here. And thanks for everyone's time. And sorry, we're, we're going over a little bit. Uh, but this, again, can be broken out by phase. Uh, and this is at that next lower level. Um, and I'll, in this case, um, you know, I, I should mention, you can also, if you're agile shop, you can also break things out by each sprint. So that way you can track your, your, uh, your progress and, and your, your scope at, at the sprint level. Uh, in this case, within this sprint, we had 21 total design documents that, you know, that were required. Uh, we break it down by the estimated hours, the hours remaining. So as you're working through this and, and your, your team is updating their progress, and again, it's that percent complete, which is the key, you can see how they're trending and what's left, uh, what's remaining. Um, and all that detail is at, here at the, uh, at the module level. And just one more thing I wanted to show, uh, which is, is pretty important, and I re re referenced it a couple of times already, is your resource capacity. Uh, so the tool supports how, how we're doing from a resource capacity perspective. Um, so we have this page where you load. In this case, it was a sprint. Uh, that, that phase started on 7-5. Um, it went through the end of July, um, 7-30. Uh, and it automatically calculates, OK, how many working days are there? What is the uh, hours per day capacity for this resource? Again, many, many people, uh, many re uh, project team members can't dedicate a full eight hour day, um, particularly for internal um, project team members. Uh, so in that case, it'd be less than eight hours. And then unavailable hours is, typ is typically holidays or PTO, um, and actually PTO because the, it'll, the, uh, the, the formula will, will filter out the holidays. So any PTO that's planned, you can put that in there. So over the over these 20 days, you can see what's the calculated capacity by resource. Uh, and then that's where the that's more of a configuration page. And then as we're working through the project, we can go to the resource tracker. And again, we're concerned with the sprint four phase, and we can see what's been assigned. And, and again, we showed where the, the items get assigned. We can see what's been assigned to each resource what's their hours remaining and what's the calculated remaining capacity. So in this case, if you remember, uh, we were looking at the, um, the sprint four ending on 730. So there's 12 days remaining in that sprint or in that cycle. So this person was only available seven hours a day. So there's 84 hours remaining uh, as of today. And they have th this many hours uh, remaining assigned to them. So as they're updating their actuals, this is decrementing. Um, if I were to log in tomorrow, this would be down to 70, uh, 77 hours uh, because there'd only be 11 days left uh, for that resource. So this gives you a quick view of how we're, how we're tracking by resource as we work through the project. Um, so I'll stop there, Katie. Um, let me, I know we covered a lot of information. So let me get back to the deck. And just to wrap up, obviously, you know, evaluate, evaluating your customizations and new features and disconnects uh, are, are critical, I, I guess, as you work through either your PUM updates uh, or you have the, uh, you know, the capacity to take on new projects. Take advantage of the opportunity to remove older customizations. 
And all that obviously can be uh, managed through this tool, the scope tracker tool. Uh, if customization requirements remain valid, look at using the people tools capabilities. And again, that's the re what we consider a re-engineer. Uh, utilize tools to help facilitate the review and management of scope. That's more or less those dashboards I showed you. Um, those are very efficient for, for things like um, steering committee meetings and whatnot. It's all real time, assuming your folks are updating their, their items accordingly. Um, and, and again, just remember not all scope items end up becoming scope. You know, they can get deferred to a future phase using that phased uh, capabilities I showed, or that could be just rejects. If, if it's a new feature and the team reviewed it, they decide it's not something they're interested in, it becomes a reject. All right, Katie, I'll turn it over to you for the wrap up. Thank you, Jeff. Um, there was a couple of you that submitted questions. And like I said, with time, we will be following up with you individually. Um, but a couple of wrap up items here. So just join Alir at Reconnect. I know that's coming up in the next couple of months, the Reconnect Deep Dive October 4th through the 7th, as well as we have a PeopleSoft newsletter that is published monthly, which that's where we're always posting new content on PUM updates, functionality overviews, upcoming events, webinars, presentation, things like that. Um, so feel free to subscribe to that. And also there's Jeff and I's email information. If you guys have any further questions, um, feel free to email us. And we just wanted to thank you guys again for taking time to join us today. And the recording will be sent out because I know a couple of people joined late or had to leave early um, and hope to talk to you guys soon. Thank you all so much. Yep. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good day.